Right. Uh, this is le first lecture, uh, summer 2020. Uh, let's first see the CLOs and PLOs. Now, I think all of you already have studied statics class, and some of you are studying in parallel dynamics as well, right? Is that right? Are you listening to me? Sir, dynamics to prerequisite tha, see, uh, statics tha, to jinka statics clear nahi hai, wo dynamics bhi nahi pad rahe. No, but uh, many of you, uh, they are repeating. I mean, they have D grade, but they are repeating the course. Sir, then wo shayad abhi meeting mein join nahi kiya unhone. Right. So basically, uh, statics, um, they have five. Uh, CLOs and two PLOs. Basically, the statics class they will cover PLO one and PLO two. Right, and there are several objective of this uh, statics class. More, I mean, if we look at that, mainly uh, you should be able to solve the forces, moments, and the resultants, both in 2D and as well as 3D. Right, and then you should be able to solve the equilibrium problem. You will apply the laws of equilibrium uh, in the 2D as well as in 3D. And then you will try to solve the structural analysis. I mean, the forces acting on different structures, um, process, frames, and machines. And then one of the uh, objective of this class is that you should be able to calculate internal and external loading. Right, because some of the forces they are acting internally and some are acting externally. So you should be able to calculate internal and external forces. And lastly, the objective of this class is to calculate the problem related to the drive friction in statics. It right, will not cover the dynamics part or we will cover the statics part related to the drive friction and then try to apply on the wedges. Right, So these are the objective of this class mainly five objectives and these objectives will cover PLO1 and PLO2. Now these are the recommended books for this class and I have uh, put these in, in the course material. I mean you can download from the MS team. I have put that. I mean if you go to the MS team here, Microsoft team, and then on Microsoft team uh, there is uh, the files, you can see that in files, there are course materials. So in course materials, the course outlines are there as well as I have placed the books at both the Hibbler by, by Hibbler is also placed 13 edition as well as JL Merriam is there. This, this will be the reference book, but mainly uh, my lecture will be uh, based on the Hibbler book, Statics 13th edition. And then uh, let's see the course contents. Mainly we'll have the two portion. Uh, we'll try to understand 10 chapters. Uh, first five chapters, they will be based on the pre-mid and the last six, uh, five chapter, they will be covering the post-mid. And uh, regarding the evaluation method, there will be quizzes, assignments, midterm, and final exam. Quizzes will be 15%, whereas assignments will be again 15%, midterm will be 30%, and then the final exam of 40%. Right, and there are guidelines for the online courses. Please go through the course outline, which I have shared or uploaded on the MS team. You need to understand the instructions related to the attendance and the detailed uh, course plan. I mean, when you will have the assignment session, quiz session, that's already planned. So we need to follow that because the summer courses, they are based on six weeks only. I mean, regular semester is a 16 weeks and now you have just six weeks. So that means the time is very short. So every day you have to give full attention to this class, especially the summer classes. Now, if you are taking two classes, then I suggest you to give full attention to the summer classes, because if you skip any one lecture, then it's very difficult for you to meet 
again because uh, in one lecture every instructor will cover a lot of course content because this course is just for six weeks so you have to be uh, very attentive in every lecture and you please don't mix any class this is my suggestion for you and then regarding the teaching methodology this class will be the live classes i mean we call that uh, synchronous mode uh, because this is a, a recommendation from the institute that uh, all the summer courses that will go live uh, synchronous mode there will be no recorded lecture although this is uh, our lecture is recorded but i'll not share you the recorded lecture just like the um, we call the asynchronous mode that uh, any time I record that lecture and then I'll share you the link. This will not happen. This will be a live class. This recording is just for, I mean, although this class is recorded, but this is just for for your uh, convenient that maybe some some of you missed that lecture. You can see the video. Then I'll present the slide just like today's class. I'm presenting you my slides and the statics class is mostly related to the mathematics this is very important that the static class is mainly related to the mathematics right so basically you need to practice numerical problems as much as possible as an instructor i'll just give you i mean theoretical background and maybe one or two numerical problem but you have to practice as much as possible you have to i mean solve assignments you have to solve quizzes so that's why you need to practice as much as possible now there is very important point here during the class you should have notebook book pencil and calculator during this online class because i'll give you some question to solve during the class that's why you should have all the four book four items notebook book pencil and calculator during the online class and then if you look at the timetable i mean we have classes five days classes from 3 30 to 4 40 so that means the whole week you have to be present for the static class and then let's start the statics let's start from the mechanics what is mechanics any one of you It's the branch of physics uh, deals with the motion of the particles. Uh, who is there? Kizar. Uh, Kizar, what is mechanics? Sir, uh, it's the branch of physics uh, deals with the motion and kinematics of particles. Uh, basically, in mechanics, we study forces. Uh, right? In simple sense, we study forces that are acting on the object, and the object can be in motion or it can be stationary so that's very simple i mean definition that if you study the forces acting on the object and those object can be at rest and that can be in motion that's called the mechanics and mechanics has various branches like three major branches of mechanics one of them we call the rigid body mechanics deformable body mechanics and fluid mechanics right you you're familiar with the fluid mechanics I mean, in fluid mechanics, we study liquid that are moving. I mean, the forces, forces acting on the liquids or forces acting on the gases that call the fluid mechanics, right? And then we have the rigid body mechanics in which we assume that the body is rigid. That means the structure of the body is not changing. Even if we apply the force on that body, the structure is not changing. Whereas the same solid object, if there is a deformation in the that object then we call the deformable body object just like the solid mechanics i hope you will study solid mechanics maybe uh, because if you have not prerequisite for the solid mechanics maybe you are not studying the solid mechanics right and again solid rigid body mechanics they have further two branches statics and dynamics in statics right that's me211 and then dynamics me22 so we'll focus on statics for this class so what is statics? Let's see the fundamental definition of the statics. Statics mean the study of the rigid bodies at rest or at constant velocity concerning the determination of internal and external forces acting on a body. 
So basically in statics, the objective is to calculate the internal and external forces that are acting on the rigid body, which is at rest or at constant velocity. That means in statics, that's non-accelerated body. That means acceleration of the body is zero in statics. And when the acceleration of the body can be zero, when the velocity is constant or the body is at rest. V means zero, means the body is at rest or the body is moving with some constant velocity. In both cases, the acceleration is zero. So basically statics, statics mean the study of the forces of the body which are non-accelerated, where the acceleration is equal to zero, right? And the example of the statics is, let's say our room, static structure, bridges, trusses, towers connected with the cables. For example, if you look at this figure, most of the, I mean, the structure looking in this figure, they will come under this study of the statics. For example, these bridges, these trusses, right, these buildings, all the static structure, they will come under the study of the statics. Now, this subject has basically the fundamental to the vibrations. I mean, in vibration, before you study vibration, you should know how to calculate the internal and external forces, right? Similarly, the strength of the structure, which is also called sol mechanics of solid. You cannot understand the solid mechanics if you don't know how to calculate the internal and external forces, moments, couple, or equilibrium, right? Similarly, the, the machines, robotics, rocket and spacecraft design, uh, even the automatic control, engine performance, even the electrical machine, they all are related with the fundamental course statics. Because in statics, they have the basic, uh, how to calculate internal forces, external forces, moments, couple, laws of equilibrium, right? The friction forces, right the study of the structures so that's why the the statics mean a fundamental course for the upcoming engineering courses and uh, let's start from the history uh, i mean uh, history says i mean if you look at the history of the uh, statics that says that it start from the 300 bc right and uh, now it's a modern era now it started from the egyptian the history says the root of the statics is from the Egyptian and Babylonian. I mean, where they use Egyptian, basically Egyptian, they built architecture, pyramids and temples. So during that construction, they use physics and mathematics, right? So I mean, uh, building a pyramid mean they need a uh, different structure and structure mean they need to calculate the forces, right? and then they need to perform different calculations. So this is the root of the, I mean, the Egyptian, they are basically the root of the statics. Now there are fundamental concept, uh, fundamental quantities that are used in the statics. I mean, you know, length is the fundamental quantity that will be used in the statics, then the time, and then the mass, Right, and then the forces. I mean, the definition of the force is very important. Force is basically either the push or pull exerted by one body on another body. Right, a force is completely characterized because this is a vector quantity by its unit, direction, and point of application. So there, there are three main parameters that can define force. Right, and and those parameters is the magnitude of the force direction of the force and point of application of the force, right? And then um, for any subject, there are major assumption. And what are the major assumption in statics class? So basically there are, I mean, uh, models or idealizations are used in the statics in order to simplify the application of the theory, right? So there are three main assumption in the statics. Like in a, every subject, there are many assumptions. So similarly in statics, there are many, these are the major assumptions. One of the assumption is particle versus rigid body. And then the second assumption is concentrated forces. And then the small angle approximation. Let's see one by one, what is the meaning of these assumption? I mean, the assumption, first assumption mean particle versus the rigid body. I mean, in true sense, uh, 
there is no particle exists. I mean, actually, there is a rigid body. For example, let's say if we have a car, let's say this is our a big car, right? Now, actually, this car is a rigid body, right? But we can assume this car as a particle. I mean, that particle. So what's the difference between the rigid body and a particle? I mean, the major difference between the rigid body and particle is that in particle, it has mass only. I mean, we ignore the size of the object. I mean, particle has no volume. We ignore the volume, right? And we take it as a point. Particle means just a point. And this point has just mass, but no volume. Whereas rigid body has both mass as well as volume. I mean, we, in rigid body, we consider the shape and size of the object, right? And the other major difference is the motion. Particle has just one motion, which is the translation motion. I mean, this particle can move in just in translation motion. I mean, this particle move in forward direction, backward direction, up and down, whereas the, this rigid body can rotate about any axis, right? It can have the rotational motion as well, right? And the third major difference is that all forces are thought of acting on the same point. I mean, the, all the forces are acting on the point as well. Whereas on rigid body, one force can act on this point, another can act on this point, whereas other can act on this point because we are considering the size and the volume, right? Whereas on particle, the point of application of the forces will be just one particle on that particle only. So this is the first assumption in statics class that we assume a rigid body as a particle. Then the second assumption is the concentrated force, right? Concentrated force means the whole load of an object can be represented by a concentrated forces. For example, now you can you can see this one. This is a whole a very big wheel, right? And I mean the for the it has a very high weight of that because this is made of iron. But we, we if we assume that the whole weight is acting at certain one point. Then we can say this is a concentrated force, right? We assume that the whole weight is acting at one point, right? But this is applicable only when the area over which the load applied is very small compared to the overall size of the body, right? I mean, this is very small area, right? Compared to the whole object. That's why we can say this is a point load. I mean, you can see another example. For example, here there is a beam in diagram A and there is a uniformly loaded load which is on that beam. Let's say the length is 6 meter and uniformly distribution means 5 newton per meter. For every meter, there is 5 newton load, right? 5 newton weight. And if we convert this uniformly distributed load into a concentrated load, which is of 30 Newton because this, the total length is 6. So 6 multiplied by 5, that will be 30 Newton, right? So where it act, it will act at the center of this, right? Mass center, or we, we call the centroid of that, right? So this is called the concentrated force. So instead of the uniformly distributed load, we have converted into a concentrated force. So this is the second assumption in the statics, in the mechanics, that we can convert a distributed load into a concentrated force. And what's the third assumption? The third assumption is small angle approximation. And what is the meaning of small angle approximation? The small angle approximation mean, let's say if there is an arc, let's say this is an arc, and the radius of that arc is let's say one, and it's, it is making an angle theta. Now, if that theta is very small, let's say if the, that theta is very small, then what is the length of the arc? What is the length of the arc? What do you think? What is the length of this arc? R theta. R theta. So what is R? R is 1. So R is 1. So theta is this one. So what will be the length of the arc? That's equal to theta. So that means this length of the arc is again equal to theta. Whereas if we draw, a, let's say, a line, right, and it will become a triangle, then what is this value of this, I mean, this length? Since it is in front of the angle, so that will be sine theta, right? So sine theta is basically equal to the theta, right? Because this is equal to theta. The length of the arc is equal to theta, right? 
and this one is equal to sine theta. So that means when the angle is, is very small, then theta is approximately equal to theta. So this is the second, uh, third assumption of the statics class, that if the angle is small, then sine theta is equal to theta, right? Or approximately tan theta is equal to theta. And then if theta is very small, then cos theta is approximately equal to one. We can prove this numerically. Let's say if we take any small angle, let's say one degree, and we convert that into radian, then if we take sine one, then the value is very close to the that value, right? If we ignore that, that's very, I mean, 0 0.17453, this is 452. So that means approximately equal to. So one degree is equal to sine one degree. I mean, this is theta. So theta is approximately equal to sine theta. Similarly, if we take cos one, that's 0 0.999. That's approximately equal to one. So that's why if the angle is very small, then sine theta is equal to theta and cos theta is approximately equal to one. So these are the three assumptions that we use in statics. And then every subject is based on certain fundamentals law. Similarly, the mechanics or the statics is based on these uh, three fundamental laws of Newton. You are uh, already familiar with that. These are the laws of the motion, right? And first law, we know that uh, the, these law validity, these law can be proved through the experiments, right? And these law, they are applied for the non-accelerating reference frame. I mean, the reference frame is in statics condition. And what is the first law? First law says that if there is a particle which is moving originally at rest or moving in a straight line at constant velocity, if a particle is at rest, it will remain at rest. Or if a particle is moving, it will keep on moving, provided if there is no unbalanced force. So in the absence of the unbalanced force, a particle in rest will remain at rest. If a particle is moving with the uniform velocity, it will keep on moving. For example, here, let's say this is a particle. If these forces, if the sum of these forces is equal to zero, that means there is no unbalanced force. Then this particle, particle will keep on moving with a uniform velocity. That means if the sum of the forces is equal to zero, that means there is no unbalanced force. Then the particle will keep on moving its original state. That's called the first law of the Newtons. And what is the second law? Second law says that if there is an unbalanced force, let's say, I mean, if there is an unbalanced force, then acceleration will produce. And that acceleration is a directly proportional to that force, right? If there is an unbalanced force, that unbalanced force will create an acceleration, which is in the same direction. And that is a directly proportional to that force. And we have a constant of proportionality we call the mass. So F is directly proportional to A, or in other word, F is equal to MA. So this is the mathematical form of the Newton's law. I mean, if there is an unbalanced force F, then acceleration will produce in the direction of the force. That's the second law of Newton's second law. And what's the third law? Third law is about the action and reaction, that if two bodies, they are come in contact, then both body will apply force on each other. And that force is equal in magnitude, but in opposite in direction. For example, these are the two particles, let's say particle A and particle B. If they come in contact, this is a contact point, then A will exert force on B and B will exert force on A in the equal and opposite in direction. Mathematically, you can see that, I mean, their magnitude, this, this represents the magnitude, that the magnitude of the force A is equal to the magnitude of force B. However, this negative sign shows that the direction is reverse. I mean, they are in opposite direction. In other words, if this B come on the other side, uh, we can say sum of the forces, because they are equal in magnitude and opposite direction, the sum of the magnitude uh, is equal to zero. I mean, they will cancel each other's effect because they are action and reaction. Then there are the units of measurement we'll use in the statics class. Mainly we'll use two types of the unit. One we call the SI unit and then call the fo uh, foot second, right? Foot second or the US customary unit. Foot pound second. F is for foot, P is for pound and S for second. Right? We know the left for in SI unit, unit for the length is meter. Whereas in 
FPS system, we have the unit for the length foot. Second is the same, and for mass, we'll use kilogram, whereas for in a US customer unit, we'll use either pound square per feet or the slugs. Whereas for the force, in SI unit, we use Newton or kg meter per second square, whereas in um, US customer unit, we'll use pounds. Right? And how to convert? Sometimes, for example, if this is mentioned, let's say 32.2 pound. So this is basically the weight, right? This is basically the weight because in we have the units pound mean, that's weight or the force. So how to convert that into mass? We have to divide with the G. In G value is 32.2 feet per, per second square, right? And these are the conversion quantities available. If you if you need to convert, I mean, uh, let's say FPS unit into SI unit, you can use these conversion factor for the force, for the mass, or for the length. But normally, I'll try to use uh, SI unit as much as possible. But if there is some uh, numerical problem given in the uh, FPS unit, then you have to use these conversion. And then let's start from the scalars and vectors. What is scalar? All physical quantity, they are either uh, using the their mention in terms of scalars or in terms of vectors. What is a scalar? You know that a scalar is any positive or negative. It could be positive or negative physical quantity that is completely specified by its magnitude. I mean, just a numerical value is required to specify any scalar. And there are a huge example of the scalars. I mean, important of them is mass, density, volume, temperature, time, energy, area, speed, and length. They are the examples of the scalar quantity. So these scalar quantity just required a numerical value. I mean, numerical value and a units. They don't require any direction, whereas opposite quantity is vector. A vector is, is a completely specified both the magnitude as well as direction. Right, and there are many example of the vector quantity. Force is a vector quantity, right? For force, you need to know the magnitude of the force and the direction of the force. Similarly, for momentum, displacement, velocity, acceleration, impulse, and momentum, these are all vector quantities. And how we represent the vector quantity? We represent the vector quantity, the magnitude we represent with the length of the arrow, whereas the direction we represent with the angle of theta, right, between the vector and a fixed axis, whereas the head or tip that indicate the sense of the direction of the vector. For example, here is an example of the vector. Let's say this length, basically, the length of the vector will represent the magnitude. There is a scale for that. Let's say this much represent one. So one, two, three, four. Maybe four is the length of the vector. And this direction is the angle made by that vector with certain axis. So that's let's say 20 degree C, right? And the direction of the arrowhead will give you the sense of the direction, right? Where is the sense of that vector? Then uh, let's see the types of the vector. So there are mainly three types of the vector. We call the free vector, sliding vector, and fixed vector. What are the free vectors? A free vectors mean whose line of action is not confined, right, or associated with a uh, line or space. That means that's a free vector that can be represented. I mean, the direction will be same, but that can be represented anywhere in the space. That's called the free vector. For example, if a body is in translation motion, I mean, that's moving in a straight line, then the velocity of any point in the body may be taken as vector, and this vector will be described equally well the velocity of every point in the body. Right? For example, this is a body, right? And this body is moving, I mean, translational motion in a straight line in the y direction. Let's say this body is moving in a y direction in a straight line. Then the we don't need to mention the velocity of each particle. I mean, if we just, let's say, if we just mention this one, that will, men, that will give you the velocity of the each particle, each particle of that body, that they each particle is moving in the y direction and in a straight line. Similarly, if I put this value, let's say c, c vector, that will again be equal to this vector. Or 
if I mention this vector, that will be equally same as this vector. So you can understand this is called a free vector that can be represented anywhere in this space, but in the same direction. So that called the free vector, right? Whose line of whose line of action is not fixed, whose application is not fixed. Like these vector can be represent can be used for let's say velocity. They can be used for acceleration or for displacement. Whereas we have this second category, it is called a sliding vector. In sliding vector, it can be slide along the line of action of that vector, right? For example, you can see here is a force. Let's say the force is applied at point A, but the line of action of force is this one, a straight line. So along the line of action of this force, that can be slide. That can be slide. Let's say if the effect is to move this body or the amount of this body, if we apply even here, let's say if the same force is represented, let's say at this point, let's say here. If I say, if I plot here, that will have the same impact, right? Or even if I represent here along the line of action, it will represent the same thing that this force is acting along this line of action. So that's called sliding vector, right? And the third one, similarly here, this is a rigid body, let's say, and the rigid body, on, on that rigid body, you want to show certain force, let's say this one, uh, right? Along this line of action of that force, we can represent anywhere. So that's called the sliding vector, right? Along the line of action of force, that vector can be sliding one, right? And the last category is the fixed vector. Fixed vector mean it is fixed. The line of action is fixed and the point of application is fixed. That's called the fixed vector. Right? And there are many examples. For example, here, the line point of application is fixed and the line of action is fixed. Similarly, here, the point of application is fixed and the line of action is fixed. Similarly, let's say a bracket uh, is fixed with some structure and a rope, let's say cable is connected with that. Now, for to represent this one, this force, now the point of application as well as the line of ap application because it is making certain angle theta. So we'll represent with a fixed vector. You can see that this is a fixed vector which represent the line of action as well as the point of application is fixed. So that's called a fixed vector. Right? And then we have a very important principle we call the principle of transmissibility. Principle of transmissibility says that um, if the effect is not changed, like the effect is if we apply a force, let's say if you apply a force in the term of a, in the form of a push to this small car, let's say we apply a force in the form of push. And now the objective is to, to move in, in the forward direction. Then if we can represent the same push as pull, because if the effect is not changing, because the effect is to move this car in a forward direction. So that's called the principle of transmissibility. that we can transmit, we can transmit that force along the action of force. Right? So that's called the principle of transmissibility that the external effect of a force on a rigid body will remain unchanged. I mean, the, the effect, external effect on this body will remain constant, unchanged. If the force is moved, to act on its line of action. So this is the line of action. So if you apply along the line of action, then there is no change in the effect to this body. That's called the principle of transmissibility. And then the last chapter of this class is a free body diagram. What is free body diagram? What is free body diagram? आवाज आ रही है आपको हेलो व्हाट इज फ्री बॉडी डायग्राम फोर्सेस ड्रा करते हैं बॉडी uh, में जो एक्ट कर रही होती है सो फ्री बॉडी डायग्राम इज बेसिकली ऑल द एक्सटर्नल फोर्सेस दैट आर एक्टिंग ऑन द बॉडी दैट्स कॉल्ड द फ्री बॉडी डायग्राम आई मीन रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ ऑल द एक्सटर्नल फोर्सेस on any object that's called the free body diagram right uh, i mean let's say there are many object on a system 
then we have to isolate that object from the whole system in order to draw, draw the free body diagram, right? That means we have to isolate first the body and then we have to draw all the external forces on that body and that called and that call the free body diagram. Free body diagram is one of the important thing. I mean, this is the most important thing in in this in, in understanding of the static class. If you can draw the free body diagram, the remaining is just the calculation. I mean, if, if you understand that how many external forces are acting and where they are acting, that's called the free body diagram, right? Remaining is just the calculation, right? Applying certain equation, right? So this is very important. So let's try to understand how can we draw the free body diagram? So let's start from this object, the first one, right? Now, <laughs> yes. Sir, our thermal class has started. Time okay. time's okay. class is our. Maybe one or two can be possible, but majority is not. Sir, we are going to the class. Sir, it's up to you, but I'll. This is the last slide. Okay, sir. If, okay, you, sir. if you can spare four or five minutes, this is the. Okay, uh, okay thank you, sir. Slide. Right. Uh, how to draw the free body diagram of these six objects? You should be able to draw that. Now, first of all. We have to select ki hum which object we are going to draw the free body. Diagram. For example, the free body diagram of this hook will be different compared to this object, right? For example, let's start from this one, um, this carrier, free body diagram of this carrier, right? It depends if you want to draw the free body diagram in three dimensional, that will be different than the two dimension. For example, let's say uh, if I start from the 3D, so what will be the free body diagram of this object in three dimension? You can see, I mean, this is the this is the object, and in three dimension, how many forces will be acting? Four forces. I mean, in all the four axes, one force will be this one, right? Another force will be second force will be this one, third force will be this one, and this is the fourth force, right? And which which force will be acting downward? Its weight. So the four forces from the cable, one, two. Uh, three and four. Four force forces from the cable and one uh, weight will be acting downward. Whereas if I try to draw the free body diagram in 2D, then what will be the free body diagram of this and uh, this object? Just two forces. I mean this this will be like a particle. Let's say if I assume this as a particle, then one force will be acting in this direction, one force will be acting in this direction, and the weight will be acting downward so that will be the free body diagram of this carrier what about the free body diagram of this hooks Sir, what will be char strings hai, wo, wo no uh, if you take the i mean uh, in 2d i mean if you look at the front view of this one in front view you will just see this one and this one and the weight will be acting downward but if you consider the three dimension in three dimension you will see all of the four cables and the weight, right? So that will be the dif uh, different. Similarly, what about this hook? Free body diagram of this hook. So let's say this is our hook. And if you need to draw the free body diagram of that, that, that means the two ropes, they are acting upward, right? The two ropes in tension, they are acting downward and the weight of this hook will be acting downward. And similarly, this hook is connected with four different hooks, right? One, two, three, and then four. So this will be the free body diagram of this hook, right? And similarly, let's see this figure. So what is the free body diagram of this one, this pulley? Now this pulley and the object B, they are interconnected. So we'll take this as one particle because this these two particles, they are connected with that rope. So this, we have to assume this as one single particle. So let's say this is one single particle. So what is the free body diagram? So since this is the one rope, single rope is using here. So that means let's say this is T. T is acting upward, right? Again, another T is acting upward, right? And then the weight of this B is acting downward. Right? So this is the free body diagram of this system. What about the free body diagram of A? What will be the free body diagram of A? Right. Again, we have to see where is the tendency of motion of A. Where is the tendency? 
the tendency is that it may move in the right direction it may move in the left direction we have to see the weight of this body if the weight of the b is very small then the tendency is to move in the right direction if the weight of the b is larger then the tendency is move in the left direction let's say the tendency of this a we assume that is in right direction so where will be the force of friction force of friction will be acting in opposite direction to the movement of a so this is the friction force let's say f f that's the frictional force acting on a and then the weight of this a will be acting downward weight and the frictional force and then the normal reaction na right so these are the this is the free body diagram of a right so let's see this uh, this system now so what will be the free body diagram of a what will be the free body diagram of a first of all we have to draw that plane that on plane the particle a is placed let's say this is the particle a which is placed there right and what is the force acting on the a all the external forces acting on the a one is the tension tension of that rope a right t is acting on that particle and then what else weight weight is always acting downward that's the weight acting downward and then the frictional force if the tendency of a is to move upward then the frictional force will be acting downward so this is the frictional force right so the frictional force will be acting downward and similarly the normal reaction n right normal reaction n so this is the free body diagram of a similarly you can draw the free body diagram of b right and similarly in this system what is the free body diagram of this particle a right what is the free body diagram of particle a the rope tension the rope is acting upward right and then the weight is acting downward so that's the free body diagram of this particle a what about the free body diagram of this car what will be the free body diagram of this car i mean the tension in the rope t right weight of this car will be acting downward and where is the tendency of motion since this v indicates in the right direction so the frictional force will be acting in the left direction f f right and then if there is a friction force then there will be normal reaction n that will be acting upward so this is how we can draw the free body diagram i mean each particle has a different free body diagram similarly each particle has different free body diagram we need to isolate that particle right we can isolate that particle and then we can draw the free body diagram so there is an assign assignment for you i mean particle a please draw the free body diagram of particle a and particle b right try to submit me uh maybe until 8 pm you have to upload i mean on the same group everyone has to upload the free body diagram of each particle let's say here we have particle a this one right and here we have particle b right this rope uh, this pulley and this pulley please share your free body diagram of these two particle that's your first assignment right that's the end of this class if you have any question you can ask me sir yes सर ये जो अभी आपने लास्ट स्लाइड शो की थी इसके अंदर जो कार की आपने फ्री बॉडी डायग्राम बनाई है तो वो फोर्स एक्सर्टेड बाय इंजन है वो हम शो नहीं करेंगे फ्री बॉडी फोर्स एक्सर्टेड बाय एन इंजन यस अगर वो प्रॉब्लम है अगर मेंशन है द इंजन एक्सर्ट्स अ फोर्स मे बी इंसर्ट वेलोसिटी वेलोसिटी की डायरेक्शन से हम फोर्स नहीं हम शो करेंगे uh, नहीं वो वेलोसिटी की डायरेक्शन uh, हमें ये बता रही है Okay, where is the tendency of motion? Okay, because if you want to, I mean, if you want to, uh, uh, I mean, take into account the velocity, I mean, friction force. Let's say in few of the uh, numerical problem, um, they sometimes mention ignore friction, but sometimes you have to uh, consider the friction. So basically, the direction of velocity. tells you that where is the direction of motion of this car so direction of motion is from left to right so the friction force will be from right to left yes you are right okay, if the 
engine force is mentioned let's say it says that the engine apply force uh, let's say 20 horsepower in in the forward direction then again this information is for the force right we then we'll take a frick force of the engine in the forward direction right if the force that force is not mentioned then we have to ignore that force right okay sir hmm. अटेंडेंस का क्या है ये सिस्टम है ऑलरेडी अभी एम एस टीम में आ जाते कि हु वॉज ऑनलाइन हु अटेंडेंट दिस क्लास सो द रिकॉर्ड इज ऑलरेडी ऑनलाइन अवेलेबल यू डोंट नीड टू वरी अबाउट दी अटेंडेंस राइट सो एनी 